So now let's go ahead and turn our attention to another aspect of the atomics features in Java. And this will cover Java volatile variables. And we're going to talk about how volatile variables could be used to provide concurrent programs with thread safe mechanisms to read from and write to single or individual variables. When a concurrent program is not written correctly, as we've discussed before, the errors that are incurred tend to fall into three categories, atomicity, visibility, and or ordering. And some programs will have one of these, some programs will have multiple of these kinds of problems if you don't follow the, the synchronization patterns and practices correctly. What the volatile keyword does is it ensures that changes to a variable, in other words, when it's read to, uh, read from or written to, are always consistent and are always made visible to other threads atomically. So the transporter beam analogy is the one we've been using throughout the class. And what that means in, in reality under the hood is that reads and writes go directly to main memory, not to registers, not to caches, in order to avoid read-write conflicts on Java fields that store shared mutable data. So it goes directly there. It's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like uh, Monopoly. I think I'll show Monopoly thing. Go directly to jail, do not pass go. And the other dimension of this is that reads and writes cannot be reordered. They go in the order in which they're performed in the program. Now, the way this works under the hood is that whenever you have a volatile variable, then any reads and writes that volatile variable are automatically updated by the compiler to atomic acquire and release pairs. And these are typically done with low level hardware instructions. The, the compiler generates bytecode that will use these low level hardware instructions. And you never see this. This is all done for you on your behalf. And see, these are very, basically lightweight synchronization mechanisms that are added and uh, part of the instruction set of Java. If you're programming an entirely sequential code base, then you don't need to have volatile at all. So if you have things that go in sequence in one thread, you don't need volatile. Now let's talk about this a little bit. It's a little confusing at first. So reads and writes of most Java primitive variables are inherently atomic. So for example, if you're reading and writing something like an int or a care, for example, or a short, those operations are inherently atomic. And what that means is if the one and only thread writes to a variable and then turns around and reads from it, then you don't have to worry about any inconsistency in that particular case because those calls are atomic, mostly because there's no reordering at that level. Now, if you're dealing with other types like longs and doubles, which at least on some instruction sets and in some bus uh, sizes will require multiple reads or writes at the bus level, you're still fine in a single threaded program because the operations will never be interleaved. So a single threaded program, as you might expect, will do things sequentially. And even if there's operations that take multiple steps, because for example, you're writing a long, which is a 64-bit quantity, and you've got a 32-bit bus, even though there's two operations required to write that, then you're still fine because there's nothing else trying to interleave or compete. There's only one thread. In contrast, when we start working with concurrent programs, then there are situations where volatile is needed. And the reason for this is because of caching. So one thread may not see the latest value of a, of a variable that's been changed by another thread. And there's various reasons for this. So one reason is due to caching. So let's assume for sake of argument that we've got a memory hierarchy that looks sort of like this. This is the kind of common hierarchy you would have with a modern multi-core processor where you've got main memory and then you've got caches for the different cores. So if thread T1 or thread one writes a value to a non-volatile field NV, that will be cached locally in the core for efficiency. So it won't actually propagate immediately up to main memory. And that's often a good thing. You want that because you don't want to have to keep going to main memory because that would slow your program down. However, when thread two reads the value of NV, it could get 
an old, out of date result because the result still cashed in cash one's cash, the, the core, the cash for thread one, which is running on core one, just for sake of argument. And instead, thread two is running in a different core and its cash has a different value. So the, we now have inconsistency of values. So how do we solve this problem? Well, the way one way to solve this problem is to use Java volatile, which is a keyword that indicates to the compiler and then to the runtime system ultimately that the values should not be cached. So a value that's written to a volatile variable will always be stored immediately in main memory or as immediately as can be the case, uh, given the fact that it takes a little bit to get there. So this is kind of that, you know, go directly to jail, do not pass go, do not click $200 kind of thing. It's writing from the thread running on a core and it's of course updating the cache memory, but it's also going and updating main memory as well. And what this in induces is something called a happens before relationship. And we'll talk later about what happens before means in more detail. But for right now, all it means is if you write something to a volatile variable, that will happen before all subsequent reads of the same variable. So it's just another way of saying that the value will be consistent for all the threads that read immediately after that value is written to. Access to a volatile variable will always be read from main memory. So it's not read out of the cache. Instead, it's read out of main memory. So again, the cache is bypassed when you do a read. Now, of course, the cache could be updated. The local cache could be updated as a side effect of that read. But the key point is that you're reading from main memory. Volatile reads are cheap and volatile writes are cheaper, not as cheap as volatile reads, but they're cheaper than synchronized statements. So volatile is, like I said before, it's kind of a lightweight synchronized, if you want to think of it that way. By using volatile, we not only guarantee this consistency property we talked about before, but we can also guarantee atomicity for types in Java that are potentially larger than the bus size. So for example, if we have this program here and we're writing this and running it on a 32-bit machine, then writes and reads from long will require multiple instructions because a long, of course, has 64-bit resolution or precision. And so as a consequence, what will happen if we run this program and we're not using volatile, and we happen to be running on a 32-bit machine, we're likely to have situations where the reads that we're doing are not going to be consistent with either the value of A or of B. There'll be a little of both, which of course is a very unexpected and problematic outcome. So if you take a look at the Stack Overflow article at the bottom of the page, it'll give you some more details about why this is the case. And you can also try running the program to see what it does on your machine. Now, if you actually have a machine with 64-bit with a bus, then you probably won't have this problem occur. But you have to be careful when you're writing Java code because, of course, the intent is to make it uh, be written once and run anywhere, irrespective of the bus size, which is a kind of a low-level thing. So volatile can be very important in that case. Reads and writes are atomic for all variables declared as volatile including longs and doubles, which again, on some instruction sets or some processors are going to be uh, larger than the size of the bus. Reads and writes are always atomic for Java references. This is a little bit interesting. So if you have a Java reference, which would be, you know, like um, stack S equal new stack, then S is a reference those are also always atomic. You don't have to define those as being volatile. They're going to be, um, the, the reference values are always atomic. The other thing that volatile does, just to continue on with all the cool things it will do for you, is it guarantees visibility. So here's a case where we've got a little program, I think we've looked at a variant of this before, where we're going to have a flag, a Boolean flag called M is stopped and we define it as volatile. And as a consequence, what that means is whenever M is stopped is set to true, then the next time the loop in thread T2 runs, it will detect that M is stopped. And so it'll stop. So it'll 
be used to properly shut down the thread. And that ensures that the write from thread T1 in the stop me method to M is stopped will be propagated promptly to a following read that takes place in thread T2 when it checks in the loop condition whether M is stopped or not. Were you to take out the volatile, that wouldn't necessarily happen. It just could run forever, in fact. And so what that means is that the volatile writes value will be visible to happens after reads. So it's just another way of saying that the write to the M is stopped variable will happen before the reads that occur. And then finally, M is stopped guarantees ordering as well. And the ordering constraints describe what order operations are seen to occur in different threads. And this is just, in this particular case, it's just sort of a, a variant of what we talked about before, where the write to M is stopped in T1 must happen before the T2 read completes. So the ordering will also be fine as well. Now, keep in mind with volatile, it's very important to remember, volatile really deals with reads and writes to single variables. Incrementing a volatile variable is not an atomic operation. It involves multiple steps. And so there's no guarantees for those steps. So if multiple threads try to increment a volatile at the same time, then an update might get lost. And we've talked about this before when we talked about read-write conflicts and write-write conflicts and so on, when we talked about atomicity at the very beginning. So the problem we run into here is that we have two threads that are incrementing a volatile variable. And even though the reads and writes are atomic, incrementing is not atomic. And so you don't know whether you're gonna end up with the value of two or one here because there's no guarantees about that. If you need guarantees on these kinds of things, one way to solve the problem is simply to use the Java atomics package like atomic integer or atomic long or atomic bool, boolean or whatever you need to do. Uh, there are other ways to do it, of course, too, by using synchronized methods like synchronized keyword for synchronized methods, synchronized statements, or various synchronizers like reentrant lock and so on. So that's the end of the overview of volatile. What we're going to do next is talk about some examples and then discuss usage considerations for how to apply volatile correctly in practice.